It is a clear morning in Macerata, a small hillside town in eastern Italy. In Europe, one sees many villages like this, ancient and peaceful. Being in Macerata seems like living in another age. An exhibition is taking place in one of the oldest buildings of the village. The topic is the history of discovery and science in the 15th and 16th centuries. On this world map dated 1508, the outlines of the Eastern world are still quite vague. 500 years ago, the maker of this map referred to the far off and mysterious land of China as Cathay. Marco Polo's discoveries had caused a sensation in Europe, but in order to clarify this still very fuzzy picture of the world, more Marco Polos would be required. This burial tablet, located on the left side of the exhibition room, commemorates just such a person. In November 1610, the Chinese Emperor Wanli decreed that the Italian missionary Matteo Ricci would be granted the extraordinary privilege of a true Chinese burial. Some people ask the scholar Ye Xiang Gao why Matteo Ricci was being given a Chinese burial. For foreigners, this had never been allowed. Ye Xiang Gao replied that Ricci's translation of Euclid's elements alone warranted this honor. At that time, this classic work on mathematics was regarded with highest esteem. It remains a witness to a remarkable period in the history of East-West cultural exchange. The heroes of this story are Matteo Ricci and his Chinese student, Xu Guangqi. In 1601, the year after Matteo Ricci and Xu Guangqi met for the first time in Nanjing, Ricci received news that created great excitement throughout the entire Jesuit community. The Chinese emperor had summoned Matteo Ricci to the Forbidden City for an audience. It was through his alarm clock, through his map, through his western paintings. These things had already won the admiration of the Wanli Emperor. When he arrived, Ricci had not foreseen that he would one day use these articles to open the palace gates, but he was also somewhat constrained by them. When Ricci was in Beijing, although he had unlocked the door to the imperial court, he was given a major assignment. He became an imperial clock maker. We have no way of knowing Ricci's feelings in accepting this appointment. But fortunately, this monotonous and tedious existence only lasted for three years. One morning in 1604, a familiar figure pushed open the door of the Nantang Church in Beijing. The arrival of this person marked a happy day for Matteo Ricci and an even happier day for the entire country. Xu Guangqi, now 43 years old, had finally passed the Jinshi Imperial Examination. Although his score was not outstanding, his senior classmate, Jinshi Huang Tiren, transferred to Xu his membership in the prestigious Hanlin Academy. This position required that Xu Guangqi remain in Beijing. Now, after a three-year separation, Xu Guangqi finally had frequent opportunities to study with Matteo Ricci. By this time, Xu Guangqi was already a devout Catholic. He assisted Ricci in publishing several books on religious doctrine. But these books alone were not enough to satisfy Xu Guangqi. He had an urgent desire to know exactly where China was situated among the Earth's territories. 
He also wanted to know whether China was ahead of or lagging behind Ricci's Europe. Xu Guangxi discussed with Ricci his questions and quandaries. Ricci said to him, "When I came from Europe, I passed by a hundred countries on the way. Compared to all of them, China's Confucian rites and music system is the most brilliant in the entire world." Then why is China at the mercy of natural disasters? Xu asked. Why do famines still occur? Ricci suggested that the main reason was that scientific skills were still not sufficiently developed in China. Ricci's answer opened the eyes of this high-ranking official to the empire's weakest area. Xu Guangxi suggested that they publish some books on European science. Matteo Ricci accepted this suggestion. It did not take long for them to decide which book to translate. Ricci made it clear to Xu Guangxi that unless they first translated Euclid's Elements, translations of other works would be meaningless. Why was Matteo Ricci so convinced of the importance of the elements? Saint Ignatius Church in Italy is named after the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola. For several centuries, the sound of the bell emanating from this church has influenced Jesuit missionaries all around the world. The Roman College where Matteo Ricci studied is located behind this church. On the roof of the church, the stone foundation of an astronomical telescope can still be found today. This monument reminds us of the eminent and sacred position this church college holds in the history of natural science. Four hundred years ago, a new subject just introduced into the college curriculum stirred up great interest among the young seminarians. The textbook for this course had been arranged and compiled from Euclid's Elements by the famous European mathematician Father Christopher Clavius. This work ignited the enthusiasm of many students for science. Among them were Galileo and Kepler, later to become known throughout the world. Christopher Clavius taught Matteo Ricci mathematics based on this textbook. In 1577, when the 26-year-old Matteo Ricci left Rome for the East, this textbook was packed in his trunk. But compared to his world map, reproduced so many times from its stone tablet, the elements did not spark that much interest among the Chinese. Going back to the winter of 1606, Xu Guangxi was beginning to increase the frequency of his trips between the Hanlin Academy and Nantan. Several hundred li from there, war broke out in Liaodong. 
For a time, this development did not affect Shi Guangxi too much. He appeared promptly each afternoon at Nantang. Here, a teacher of wide learning and great talent, and a school of broad and profound scholarship awaited him. Richie himself said that Xu Guangqi more or less compelled him to translate this book. In the book's preface, Richie states that they worked four hours a day for a year and a half without interruption, researching Euclid's geometry. Richie translated the original text into Chinese and simultaneously explained its subject matter to Xu Guangqi, who wrote it out in Chinese. Xu Guangqi expended great effort in understanding Euclid's geometry, which was actually the logic of the West. At that time in China, no one understood Western logic, making Xu's task extremely difficult. Altogether, they translated the work three times. Richie said that only two Chinese were able to master geometry. One was Xu Guangqi, the other was Li Chizhou. All the rest, although they tried hard, just could not grasp it. This was a way of thinking very difficult for Chinese of that age to comprehend. Matteo Ricci's verbal explanations and Xu Guangqi's written accounts built a bridge of East-West cultural exchange that crossed the language barrier. But to change from thinking in terms of images to logical thought required a thoroughgoing revolution of the reasoning process. This revolution was taking place quietly and attracting more and more participants. Besides Xu Guangqi and Matteo Ricci, Chinese scholars such as Yang Tingyun, Li Zhizao, Ye Xianggao, and Jesuit missionary priests Diego de Pantoya and Sabatino de Ursis were among them. By spring of 1607, Xu Guangqi and Matteo Ricci finally completed their translation of the first six volumes of the Elements. The final text was already their third version. In miscellaneous discussions on the Elements, Xu Guangqi reveals his overflowing excitement after successfully completing the translation. He who understands the essence of this book can comprehend all books. He who masters this book can master all learning. Only through geometry can one fully understand the rest. Remaining close to it closes oneself to everything else. Xu Guangqi, in his preface, states that this book could bring about a method of scientific thinking beyond geometry. He also says that he believes that after a hundred years, the book would be widely used. And that is exactly what happened. She opened the eyes of the Chinese to a new world of mathematics. In spring of 1608, when Xu was in Shanghai, he received the final edition of the Elements approved and authorized by Matteo Ricci. Ricci hoped that he could print another edition of the Elements in the South. Xu Guangxi also used this time at home to finalize another work that he and Ricci had translated together, Principles of Measurement. Although one of them was in Beijing and the other in Shanghai, their cooperative translation projects were never interrupted. It seemed as if all this was only the beginning of their collaboration. But in 1610, in the 38th year of the Wanli Emperor's reign, during the third and last year of the mourning period for his father, required by the imperial rites, Xu Guangqi received word that Matteo Ricci had died in Beijing. The dramatic opening movement of their joint symphony had come to an abrupt end, and had become instead its final movement.
Matteo Ricci, at age 57, had lived for years in the dry, cold climate of the imperial capital. From the day he left his home country at the age of 26, he would never again enjoy the bright Mediterranean sun and its cool breezes. This Jesuit missionary spent the latter half of his life sharing his knowledge of modern Western science, technology, and thought with Chinese, enabling them to explore new horizons. At the same time, he was the first one to present Chinese moral and religious thought to Europe, laying the foundation for future Chinese studies. So this is the bone of Matteo Ricci, which was sent to us after the excavation and in Pekin, where he is buried, as a sense of relic. We call it relic. For the Catholics, it is a symbol of holiness. Matteo Ricci died on May the 11th. In December of that same year, Xu Guangqi completed the required three-year mourning period for his father and returned to Beijing. He arrived too late to bid farewell to his old friend. During summer of the following year, Beijing experienced many days of heavy rain. In his home, Xu once again returned to the elements. Together with Jesuit missionaries Diego de Pantoya and Sabatino de Ursis, they reviewed the translation, made various corrections and additions, and published it again. At this time, Xu Guangxi knew that, due to Ricci's death, he would probably never be able to complete the translation of the remaining nine volumes of the Elements. His feelings were far from the elation he experienced at the first publication of the Elements. He wrote a new preface to this edition, recalling the entire process of translation, and ended it with a lyrical lamentation. The completion of this great work who knows when it will be done? Who knows who will do it? The book lies waiting 